Hello again, poets and poetry lovers, to another session of Morning Gym Poetry. This is Jim Ransom, welcoming you and ready to read some interesting poetry. I'm going to be concentrating on um, African-American poetry, and I'm going to start with a very early African-American poet, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, he would have considered himself a Negro poet. His name was Langston Hughes, and he was part of the Harlem Renaissance. I could have picked some others because uh, the Negroes uh, who were taking part in the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s were uh, intellectuals who were widely read and they were very good in poetry and in very various kinds of music. Um, and so this was a major intellectual movement in America. <clears throat> and then I'm taking a more recent poem, uh, sorry, poet, from uh, the more modern end of the spectrum, whose name is Rita Dove. And um, I think the two of them actually bookend um, the transmission of Negro poetic skill over the last century very well. Um, <clears throat> Langston Hughes had an interesting career influenced early on by Walt Whitman and even Emily Dickinson, <clears throat> he wanted to write in Negro dialect and did so, although he also wrote in standard uh, upper-class English when he wanted to. His worst critics were other Negro intellectuals involved in what was called the Harlem Renaissance, uh, as I mentioned, and they thought the use of Negro dialect cheapened their efforts to achieve higher educational levels and scientific interests and literary levels for Negroes. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, I, I'm going to give you some examples of... Uh, of... Uh, Langston Hughes's efforts, <clears throat> um, and we're going to start with a Negro dialect poem that he wrote early on in his career called The Poor Boy Blues, The Poor Boy Blues. <clears throat> By Langston Hughes. <clears throat> When I was home, the sunshine seemed like gold. When I was home, the sunshine seemed like gold. Since I come up north, the whole damn world's turned cold. I was a good boy, never done no wrong. Yes, I was a good boy, never done no wrong. But this world is weary, and the road is hard and long. I fell in love, I fell in love with a gal I thought was kind, fell in love with a gal I thought was kind. She made me lose my money and almost lose my mind. Weary, weary, weary early in the morn, weary, weary early, early in the morn. I'm so weary. I wish I'd never been born. Now that's typical of Langston Hughes' um, dialect poetry. And <clears throat> you can see in it some of the rhythm of the blues as well as the uh, rhythm of the Negro spirituals that have been with us since at least the time of the Civil War, and maybe even before. 
Um, <clears throat> let's see what else Langston Hughes has brought us. <clears throat> but I want to tell you a little bit more about this very, very interesting guy, Langston Hughes. Um, he, uh, he was a traveling man. He was financially successful with his poetry fairly early on. And he traveled a lot, including the almost um, mandatory trip to Spain during the Spanish Civil War, which a lot of the literati of the times from England, France, and the United States did, because they were all very sympathetic with the communist uh, part of the revolution. <clears throat> and, um, and so he... Uh, he went to sp the Spanish Civil War, managed to stay out of trouble, <laughs> and then, uh, as a part of his uh, flirting with communism, he went to Russia. And that was during the early days of the Stalin um, Soviet Union. And uh, he was uh, somewhat less enchanted with Russia than he thought he would be. <clears throat> but he came back to the United States and started out his time here as a communist. But he, he lost interest in that uh, as, the first world, as the Second World War began. And he began to realize that both communism and Nazism were not very good. So he came all the way around in his politics, and he gave up on communism fairly early on in his career. Um, <clears throat> here's another poem that I would call a transitional poem. It's, it's not in Negro dialect, but it's got some of the echoes of that. It's called Cross. My old man's a white old man, and my old mother's black. If ever I cursed my white old man, I'd take my curses back. If ever I cursed my black old mother and wished she were in hell, I'm sorry for that evil wish, and now I wish her well. My old man died in a fine big house. My ma died in a shack. I wonder where I'm going to die, being neither white nor black. Um, <clears throat> did, uh, Langston Hughes really never claimed to be a mulatto or a cross between white and black, although you would think maybe he did believe that, but he didn't. This was the subject of a poem, and I'm sure he was trying to express the views of people he knew that were in that situation. Um, but <clears throat> his own father was an interesting character, to say the least. I don't think he had a whole lot to do with Langston's education. He left the family home uh, early on, and, and he went to Mexico. Um, and why did he go to Mexico? Well, <laughs> according to him, it was because he didn't like Negroes. He, being one, didn't like Negroes. How ironic. I guess... He preferred the mixed blood, mixed colored Mexican culture to the American culture. And who can blame him for that? So that's what happened to his father. Langston Hughes himself um, really had a pretty good life in the United States. And he finally died of cancer in 1967. 
Now let's turn our attention to Rita Dove. Um, she was a very interesting person in, in her own right. Um, her father was the first chemist to work for um, the rubber industry, and I think that was in Dayton, uh, Ohio. I've got some notes about Rita written on a card here. She was born in 1952. I'm sorry, it wasn't Dayton. It was Akron, Ohio. And as I mentioned, her father was the first black chemist ever hired by the rubber company. Uh, and I think it was Firestone. Um, her parents were both very well educated and intellectual people. They encouraged her to uh, learn to read at an early age and to read widely, which she did. Um, she went to <clears throat> Miami University in Ohio, not Miami in Florida, but Miami University in Ohio. Um, she spent a year at Tübingen University in Germany and um, got her MFA then later from the University of Iowa in 1977. So she's had a very thorough education and mostly literary education. After publishing a, a book of poetry in 19... 82, um, she won the Pulitzer Prize that year. She was uh, um, it, uh, the Poet Laureate of the United States from 1993 to 1995, and <clears throat> she has gotten 29 <laughs> honorary doctorate degrees from universities all over the world, mostly in the United States. Um, many other honors have come her way. And uh, now she serves as a professor of creative writing at the University of Virginia. That's an amazing career. And uh, I've just barely touched on the number of prizes that she's won. But let's read some of her poetry. That's what we're here for. Here's one called Flirtation by Rita Dove. And it's on two pieces of paper. I hope I can get them separated. Which is one of the hardest things you have to do when you're trying to record a presentation. <laughs> Ah, uh, Flirtation is the name of this poem by Rita Dove. After all, there's no need to say anything at first. An orange, peeled and quartered, flares like a tulip on a Wedgwood plate. Anything can happen. Outside, the sun has rolled up her rugs, and night strewn salt across the sky. My heart is humming a tune I haven't heard in years. Quiet's cool flesh. Let's sniff and eat it. There are ways to make the moment a topiary so that the pleasure's in walking through. Now that's Rita Dove's poem, Flirtation. I think it's very good, and it has a lot of innuendo in it. Um, and I like that in a poetry. It's um, deceptively simple, but very um, communicative. <laughs> now, <clears throat> she's written another poem that I came across while well, I was researching some of her poems for this program. And it's called American Smooth. <clears throat> Where 
We were dancing. It must have been a foxtrot or a waltz. Something romantic but requiring restraint. Rise and fall. Precise execution as we moved into the next song without stopping. Two chests heaving above a seven-league stride. Such perfect agony. One learns to smile through ecstatic mimicry, being the sine qua known of American smooth. <coughs> and because I was distracted by the effort of keeping my frame, the leftward lean, the head turned just enough to gaze out past your ear, and always smiling, smiling, I didn't notice how still you'd become until we had done it for Two measures, four measures, achieved flight, that swift and serene magnificence before the earth remembered who we were and brought us down. I don't think I've ever read a poem <laughs> about dancing and about American smooth that was as smooth and as descriptive as that one, it's a great poem. Now, let me peel another piece of paper here so that I can get to some more comments I have to make about these poets. So you can see Langston Hughes at the first part of the Hundred Years Span, and then Read a Dove beginning in the 1950s <clears throat> and really setting the world on fire with her poems. I have some other poems by these poets, but not enough time to read them. It should be pretty clear that black poets have made a success of life in America. Their work is now an integral part of American literature um, I have to say that there's some black poetry um, just in the 21st century now that I don't like very well. Some of the more recent poems in which rap has entered the scene with a liberal sprinkling of the F word are not going to last long, in my opinion. It's got to be a fad and not the real heart of where English language poetry is going. Thanks for stopping by and listening. I'm Jim Ransom, and I hope you'll be back to join me next week. Bye.